ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وطبيب قلوبنا الرسول الأمجد المحمود الأحمد أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلي وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلي The topic of mental health is one of the important topics that are being discussed nowadays. As we are becoming more aware of the widespread of uh, various mental illnesses all around the world, we notice that it is very prevalent in many countries, even in our countries here. Mental illnesses are common in Canada and the United States. One in five Canadians experience a mental illness or addiction problem. By the time a Canadian reaches the age of 40, one in two have or have had a mental illness. These statistics are also similar in the United States. Nearly one in five American adults live with a mental illness. That's over 50 million people. Mental illnesses include various conditions and uh, they vary in their degree of severity. Some of them are mild, some of them are moderate, others are severe. However, the issue is increasing day by day, year by year. We're not getting any news reports that, uh, you know, any good news reports. There are no better news. The news that we're getting is worse and worse, and day by day it's not getting better. Anyways, so while the reasons and the causes for each and every illness is different, it's not one cause and it's not one reason, However, our topic today focuses on the benefit of believing in Allah or believing in faith in religion um, with regards to um, how it benefits us with regards to preventing, coping, supporting, uh, or even healing mental health issues. Brothers and sisters, we believe that Islam is a perfect way of life. Islam is a perfect system. It is a perfect system for every human being at any place, at any time, at any circumstance. Islamic laws, guidelines, regulations, they are uh, beneficial. They benefit us a lot on a personal level on a family level, on a community level, on a societal level, even in terms of uh, economic issues, political issues, international relations, so on and so forth. Islamic laws, regulations, and guidelines not just benefit us here in this world. It also benefits us in the grave and in the world to come. So in tonight's lecture, I want to focus on how Islam benefits us on a family level and on a societal level. I'll focus on these two points and inshallah we'll discuss it after a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. As parents, Children, siblings, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters, we have to realize the importance that lies in maintaining ties with family members, in keeping ties with our relatives. One of the greatest relationships that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to embrace is our kinship. It is an obligation in Islam 
to keep ties with our blood relatives. Our kin, as defined by our maraja, is anyone that the custom um, or the social customs consider as uh, relatives. يعني, ranging from grandparents, parents, siblings, uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, so on and so forth. I mean, this is something that is known who are our relatives. So it is an ethical obligation and it is a religious obligation to keep ties, to maintain ties with our relatives. What do I mean by maintaining ties? Does it mean يعني, I have to call them? Yes. I have to visit them? Yes. I have to help them out if they're in need? Yes. يعني, on Eid, I have to give them a call? Yes, that's what I mean by it. Maintaining ties with your relatives. Okay, how much should I maintain? Every day I should call them? This depends. Are you living in the same city? Are you living in the same house? Or... Are you living in two different continents? But what's important is that you never sever these ties. You never cut these ties. If you live with someone in the same house or in the same city, it is a norm that you see them every day or every other day. But if you are living on t in two different continents, then the norms, at least during Eids, happy, sad events, so on and so forth, you tend to communicate with each other. Maintaining ties is very important and it's becoming more and more significant in our modern times. Why? Because the notion of maintaining relations with family members is fading away. The notion of keeping connection and maintaining relations with family members is fading away. We're noticing it day by day. Maintaining relationships and embracing our heritage is happening, is becoming something of the past. And this is something that is very unfortunate and something that we need to watch out. While our grandparents and parents, they used to make sure to maintain these connections, it's not something that we really find it in our lives today. A lot of people are severing their connections with their families. Unfortunately, as due to the contemporary culture that we're facing, that we're living in, the shift in focus from large communal family to a nuclear family, which is now a type of the modern family. The modern family is now the nuclear one, not the large communal one which our parents and grandparents were used to. This is a growing t trend that people are generally less concerned with staying connected with their relatives, with their kin. And if this continues, we will soon be departing from any appearance of a family. Any appearance of a family. And soon we'll be just concerned with ourselves. The shift in this society moving from being a family-centric to individualistic has serious ramifications, has serious consequences. It is not something that will go without any ramifications or consequences. When we observe communities, they have abandoned uh, their family relations and they embraced pure individualism, we found the natural, natural deterioration in family relationships. And self-centered relationships never serve a true, long-lasting purpose. This is why we notice Islam puts a special emphasis on building and maintaining relationships with blood relatives. There is a lot of stress. Many ayat, many ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt, numerous ahadith, that mentions the importance of keeping family ties and stresses upon Muslims to keep their family ties and never sever them. <clears throat> so the issue is not just a social phenomenon. 
The issue is it's a religious duty. Severing qat or rahim, severing uh, or cutting. Family ties is one of the major sins in Islam. It is not something that we have an option to. Okay, I don't want to keep my connection with family. No, severing ties, cutting ties is one of the major sins in Islam. So it's an act that is disliked by the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In addition to all that, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In addition to all that, human beings are social in nature. We're social in nature. We cannot rid ourselves from others and live a life of isolation. Even if we do so, such a state is not a happy and joyous state. It's a state that is usually accompanied by misery, by loneliness, which we naturally dread. We don't like to be in such a state. We yearn for companionship of others, getting to know others. This is how we're created. This is how we are wired. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Within a social fabric, there are units that a person feels a need to belong to. And the most important of them is the family. Is the family if the attachment with the family is weak it will affect the state of belonging at all other social units however if the attachment is strong then all the other units will also be strong at the same time i mean this is what makes us human beings this is part of our humanity connecting and having connections with others if we lose that, then we lo lost an important part of our humanity. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Sermon 23 of Nahj al balagha in, in his 23rd khutbah, the 23rd khutbah of Nahj al balagha he says, أَيُّهَا nas, إِنَّهُ لَا يَسْتَغْنِ الرَّجُلُ وَإِنْ كَانَ ذَا مَالٍ عَنْ عَشِيرَتِهِ, عن عشيرته وَدِفَاعِهِمْ عَنْهُ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَلْسِنَتِهِمْ O people, is, these are the words of Amir al mumini O people, surely no one, even though a person is wealthy, even though a person is rich, can do without his kinsmen, without his relatives, and their support by hands or tongues. Amir al mumini continues, وَهُمْ أَعْظَمُ النَّاسِ حِيطَةً مِنْ وَرَائِهِ وَأَلَمُّهُمْ لِشَعَثِهِ وَأَعْطَفُهُمْ عَلَيْهِ عِنْدَ نَازِلَةٍ إِنْ نَزَلَتْ بِهِ They alone are his support from behind. They're his backbone. They are the ones who can ward off from uh, him his troubles and his problems. And they are the most kind to him when tribulations befall him. Then Amir al-Mu'mineen says, وَلِسَانُ الصِّدْقِ يَجْعَلُهُ اللَّهُ لِلْمَرْءِ فِي النَّاسِ خَيْرٌ لَهُ مِنَ الْمَالِ يُورِثُهُ غَيْرَهُ And the honest tongue of praise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would create for a man amongst others is better than wealth which he will impart and he will leave it to others as inheritance. When we leave this world, are we going to take our wealth with us? No. It's going to be left as inheritance. However, the tongue of praise, when people remember you, they read Fatha for you, they remember your good deeds, the good effect that you did on people, these things will help you even if you depart this world. Silatul Rahm makes you connected to your family, which is when, the, when you're connected to the family, the family is connected to a community. And when the community is connected, being connected to a large number of people, this by itself is a source of power, a source of strength when you're connected to a lot of people. It's something that will help you 
that will benefit you and connecting with your kinship will render this effect. If we look at the words of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, salamullahi alayha, for her love, please recite aloud salawat. If we look at her words in the speech of um, in Al Khutbah Al Fadakiya, she says, "Silatul Arham, man saatun fil Umr, wa man matun lil Adat." Connecting with your kinship, connecting with your relatives, is a medium of increasing one's age, and it is an increase in friends and relations. Do you want to live longer? Connect with your family members. Do you want to become wealthier? Connect with your family members. And do you want to have more relations and friends? Connect with your family members. This is something that I've been taught in business school. That never underestimate the benefit of networking. Never underestimate the benefit of knowing people and connecting with people. You will benefit greatly from knowing people and connecting with them. You learn from them. You learn from their knowledge. You learn from their experiences. You get advice. You get support. Uh, you get opportunities in life. This builds your confidence. This will make you gain a different perspective of life. You'll get to see life from another perspective. You'll get new ideas. It increases your creativity and innovation and so on and so forth. And we notice that Islam stresses on all these points a lot. Islam stresses on these points. This is with regards to the benefits of uh, believing in God, believing in religion, how Islam benefits us on a family level. Now let us look at how the belief or the ben how how would faith, religion, and the belief in Allah benefit us on a social level? A person, first of all, finds himself respected in a community of believers, in a community of mu'minin and mu'minat. Those who practice the teachings of Islam, simply the teachings of how to greet others. Do you know that? The Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam said, "Tabassumuka fi wajhi akhika sadaqa." A smile in the face of your uh, brother is a form of charity. And if you're smiling, you're getting the reward of charity. Why don't I see you guys smiling? It's a form of charity. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam says that. Imagine when you enter and you see your friends and the first thing you see is they greet you with a smile. Doesn't that bring rest and brings peace to the heart. So, تَبَسُّمُكَ فِي وَجْهِ أَخِيكَ صَدَقَ A smile is considered charity. And the rewards for being the first to say salam, to say salam alaykum. Salam alaykum. So the, first, the, the reward for being the first to say salam, as Amir al muminin says, let's read his hadith together. As-salam sab'una hasana. تسعة وستون للمبتدئ وواحدة للرات أمير المؤمنين says that just saying سلام عليكم the greeting is 70 rewards 69 for the person who starts and one for the person who responds who responds to the salam and as you know just a fiqh issue saying سلام سلام عليكم is مستحب by the way, this salam is assalamu alaikum, not hello and hi. Hello and hi would not work. So assalamu alaikum. This hadith works for when you say the Islamic greeting. So just a fiqhi issue that saying salamu alaikum is mustahab, is recommended. Responding to the salam is wajib. But one who says salamu alaikum to, the, to, 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 to his fellow believers, he will get 69 hasanat. And the one who responds, will get also one hasana. So Islam encourages us that when you greet others, greet them with a smile and greet them with the salam. This 
this brings peace to the hearts of people. There are the various social obligations or customs that we have, and they've been emphasized in Islam, such as the issue of khuwa, brotherhood, sisterhood. One is in need to have good brothers and sisters around, good believers around, to support, to consult, to benefit from their uh, experiences, from their knowledge, to have a good time with them by keeping it halal, to encourage each other to stay firm on the faith and remain steadfast on the religion of Islam, وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ Enjoining good for, and enjoining patience, and so on and so forth. The benefits of having good brothers and sisters to, uh, uh, as friends and as uh, you know, people who we communicate with and have a relationship with them, they're beyond words. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, أَخُوكَ الَّذِي لَا يَخْذِلُكَ عَنْدَ الشِدَّةِ your brother is the one who does not abandon you when you are in difficulty. وَلَا يَغْفَلُ عَنْكَ عِنْدَ الْجَرِيرَةِ And he does not forget you at the time of trouble. And وَلَا يَخْدَعُكَ حِينَ تَسْأَلُ And he will not cheat you when you seek his advice. He will give you a sincere advice without cheating you. Amir al-Mu'mineen continues and says, Al-Ukhwanu fi Allah, Al-Ukhwanu fi Allah ta'ala tadumu mawaddatuhum li dawami sababiha. Brothers whose brotherhood is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will enjoy an enduring amity. Their friendship will last long. Their brotherhood will last for a very long time. Why? Due to the firmness of the foundation. Because their brotherhood was done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other social obligations, like for example, uh, visitation of the, visiting the sick, attending funerals, attending um, uh, the Fatiha programs, for example. These are all highly recommended in Islam. Why does Islam stress upon these social obligations because during these difficult times one is in need of support one is in need of help whether it's the time where one loses his health or when one loses a dear one and such help and support from the visitation of uh, brothers and sisters and friends and colleagues and so on and so forth it can prevent many psychological breakdowns, which can lead to several mental diseases, such as uh, schizophrenia. Helping the needy ones, helping the poor, helping the orphans, the underprivileged ones, so on and so forth, is all encouraged and emphasized in the Quran and Hadith. The Ahlul Bayt, Salamullah Alayhim, have emphasized on that a lot, and there are numerous Hadith with regards to all these issues because all these teachings will lead one to have a stable psyche because one does not feel one does not feel alone he feels the care of his community he feels that he's part of something that is bigger social solidarity itself can prevent many psychological problems that's why islam stresses on all these social obligations and it encourages believers to do so let's 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 read one hadith on the reward of visiting the sick our fifth imam imam muhammad al-baqir alayhi salam for his love please recite aloud salawat so our fifth imam he says that when musa alayhi salam whispered to his lord you know Prophet Musa is Kalimullah. He used to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he whispered to his Lord, and Damanaja Rabba, he asked his Lord, Ya Rabb, 
ما بلغ من عيادة المريض من من الأجر. What oh Lord, what is the reward for visiting the sick? A sick believer, you heard about him. He's sick. He's at home or in the hospital. What is the reward for visiting him? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "أُكِل به ملكا يعوده في قبره إلى محشرة." I will assign an angel for him to be with him in the grave till the day of judgment. So that person will never be alone in the grave. That angel will be will always be in his company. The grave is known as the house of loneliness. The most difficult time for the deceased is the first day. Because they are not used to it and they are all alone. So imagine at that difficult time and Allah sends you a perfect being. An angel to accompany you and this angel will remain with you till the day of judgment. I want to ask, will you feel the punishment of the grave when you're in the presence of this infallible being, this perfect being, the angel? This is all for the reward of what? Visiting the sick. What about the rewards for attending funerals? Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam, our sixth Imam, he says, أول ما يتحف به المؤمن في قبره أن يغفر لمن تبع جنازته. The first of what the believer is bestowed with in his grave is the forgiveness for the one who followed his coffin. So when you attend the tashia of a deceased believer, when you attend the funeral of a believer, the first thing, the first reward that you will receive is the forgiveness of your sins. Look at how Islam encourages these social obligations. Yes, there are many benefits in the hereafter, but there are also many benefits in this dunya. Preventing so many of these psychological problems, many of these mental problems, on a social level, is prevented through these social obligations. So yes, there are many rewards, but there are also many benefits in this dunya. Islam also has uh, many preventive measures to protect human beings from diseases. I will only one mention one. Tonight, the example of uh, dementia. Dementia is uh, a general term for the loss of uh, thinking, memory, uh, and m mental abilities. It's a disease that many uh, of the seniors might face. It affects many of the seniors. Islam has some preventive measures to it, such as number one, recitation of the Holy Quran, the increased recitation of the Holy Quran, and certain du'as, such as the du'as after Fajr prayer, such as the ta'qibat after Fajr prayer. An example is what is mentioned in Tahdeeb al-Ahkam, which is compiled, one of our main hadith books which is compiled by Shaykh al-Tusi, Tahdeeb al-Ahkam it is reported that whoever repeats the following dhikr ten times after Fajr prayer Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save him from listen to what Allah will save him from blindness, insanity dementia leprosy, poverty house demolition or dotage Yani being weak at an old age. What is this dhikr? Very simple. Subhanallah al azimi wa bihamdi wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al ali al azim. Repeating it ten times after Fajr. Subhanallah al azimi wa bihamdi wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al ali al azim. Shaykh al Kulayni, may Allah have mercy on him. He narrates from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam as saying, whoever repeats the following dhikr seven times, after Fajr and after Maghrib prayer, Almighty Allah will save him from 70 types of misfortunes, 70 
types of misfortunes. The least of them are leprosy and insanity. And his name will be erased from the list of the condemned ones if he is in that list. And he will be put, he will be added to the list of the happy ones. What is this dhikr? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. Seven times after Fajr, seven times after Maghrib. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. The Quran always invites us to think, always invites us to reflect. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, فقصص القصصة لعلهم يتفكرون. Therefore, relate the narrative. That they may reflect. يتفكرون. In another ayah Allah says, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Most truly there are signs in this for people who reflect. Islam encourages also to seek knowledge. Actually knowledge is an obligation in Islam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ Seeking knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim. أُطْلُبُ الْعِلْمَ مِنَ الْمَهْدِي إِلَى اللَّحْدِ Seek knowledge from cradle to grave. You're never too old to seek knowledge. You should seek knowledge at all times. There are great benefits for seeking knowledge. One of them, one of them is cases of dementia are much, much lower in scholars and ulama than in normal, regular people. One of the benefits. Constant reflection, constant thinking and study helps lower the cases of dementia for human beings. Believers are encouraged to account themselves every night. Every night, when you put your head on the pillow, think. What are the good deeds that I did? And what are the bad deeds that I did today? Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasibu. Account for your deeds before you are accounted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the good deeds that I did today? And what are the bad ones? Good deeds, keep them up, keep doing them, increase. Doing them, that's very good. The bad deeds. What should I do about it? Make a plan. How can I get rid of them? How can I stop them? And of course, seeking forgiveness, uh, asking, doing istighfar, and so on and so forth. So every night, Islam tells us, Ahlul Bayt taught us, account for your deeds. Think of what you did today. One of the benefits of that, of course, to, to, to know where you're going and to be able to get rid of your bad deeds and to clear re your record in this dunya before being accounted in Akhirah. But amongst the benefits of doing that is that this keeps the mind thinking and working. And if the mind keeps thinking and working, then this is one of the reasons how it can lower uh, the possibility of getting dementia. Maintaining family ties, visiting your relatives, visiting your brothers and sisters, keeping a relation with them, so on and so forth. All this requires man to keep uh, his using his thinking power, which helps in reducing the cases of dementia. So you notice the teachings of Islam has many benefits from different perspectives. Today we're looking at it from one perspective only. But the benefits, the teachings has benefits from various perspectives. So lastly, I want to mention one last point before we end is, yes, prayers, du'as, reciting the Quran, so on and so forth. These are all preventive measures. And these are all important. And prevention is better than cure. Al-wiqayatu khayrun min al-ilaj. 
But if someone gets sick, if someone gets some sort of illness, then he or she must go and seek help from the experts. Go find a trustworthy doctor, physician, psychotherapist, psychiatrist, so on and so forth, the expert in the field. Preventive measures are important. But if one gets sick, then seeking help from the right experts is needed, is a must. One needs to get treated if he or she gets sick. Tawakkul on Allah Du'as and prayers and supplications and so on and so forth, these are all beneficial. These are all very good in the healing process. And the Quran and Hadith have mentioned that. Science also supports that. But tawakkul alone is not enough. You need to get treated and have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'aqilha wa tawakkal. One day there was a man during the times of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was riding his camel. He stopped somewhere. And he was about to leave it. He was going to the masjid, to the market, I don't know, somewhere. Rasulullah told him, why did you leave your camel untied? You know, tie it so it won't go and leave you. He said, I have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will keep it safe. Rasulullah said, no, 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 wait. I'qilha wa tawakkal. Tie the camel to a spot and then have tawakkul on Allah that, you know, it won't get stolen, it won't, nothing will happen to it. But you have to do the step. So same thing with regards to issues like that. If one gets ill, whether this illness is physical or psychological, whether this illness is physical or mental, one needs to go treat, get treated. Go to the experts. Get treated, and yes, have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will help in the healing process, but with also at the same time, going to the expert and following their uh, directions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good physical, mental, and spiritual health and cure us from all of our inner and outer ailments with the blessings of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his holy household. Allahumma ajil li waliyik al-faraj. O Allah, hasten the reappearance of our Imam, Imam sahib al-asr wa zaman Instill happiness in his heart. Relieve him from all his worries. Protect him, ya Allah. Protect all the mu'mineen around the globe. O oh Allah, we are in this great month, the month of Ramadan, the month of forgiveness, the month of mercy. We are here to sincerely repent for our sins. O oh Allah, accept this repentance for, from us. Forgive us for our sins and mistakes. Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu ilayh. O oh Allah, answer our needs. By the right of Bab al Hawaj, Abil Fadl al Abbas, alayhi salam, O oh Allah, cure our uh, sick family members, our sick friends, our sick community members, all the sick mu'mineen and mu'minat, O oh Allah, heal them by the right of the fourth Imam, the one who was sick in Karbala, Imam Zain al Abidin, alayhi salam. O oh Allah, Grant us the tawfiq to be a true follower of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. To be steadfast on the religion of Islam. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Muqallib al-Qulub, Thabbit qulubana ala deenik. O oh Allah, grant us the tawfiq to be amongst the supporters of the awaited Savior, the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Ajal Allah ta'ala farajahu al-Sharif. And lastly, let us not forget our deceased uh, um, uh, family members, deceased friends, community members, and all the mu'mineen and mu'minat from the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha 
Before it, a loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik al-Din ya bin Ahmad. Inna sadaa masdaqin taala dinna lam taala al-Qur'an ma'adub alayhim rabbalim. Bismillah. Assalamu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum. So. Any questions, comments, feedback? The floor is open. Yes. What does ma'sumin mean? Ma'sumin? Ma'sumin mean the infallible, immaculate ones. Yani the 14 ma'sumin, they're the Prophet, Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, and the 12 Imams. So if we say al-A'imma al-Ma'sumin, we mean the 12 Imams. If we say uh, as-salamu ala al-Ma'sumin, then we're talking about the 14 uh, infallibles, the 14 Ma'sumin who are Rasulullah, Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, and the 12 Imams, from Imam Ali to Imam al-Mahdi, Ajallah Ta'ala Farajahu al-Sharif. Any question? Can you repeat the question, please? The expert, can you tell us? Yeah, you're studying. Uh, it was before, but they took it out. But because it's not considered. Like so, socially or actually scientifically? It's more likely psycho. It's more. Uh, it's not. Um, it's not a psychological disorder. If you want to keep it. 